Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Uh, we, I don't think we've talked about pirates on the podcast in a while. It's been a little bit. Yeah, we've like, they've had passing mentions in maybe unearthed episodes or other random stuff, but we have not had an actual whole episode about pirates in more than a year and a half, which is a long time. I mean, I feel like if you look hard enough, any <laughs> show can become about a pirate. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about Henry Every, who's also known as Henry Avery and as Benjamin Bridgman, and as Long Ben Avery. And he's been on my shortlist for a while, and it just said Henry Avery, and then in parentheses, pirate. And I did not write any other indication of what prompted me to put it on there. So it's a mystery why why it caught my attention in the first place. Uh, it was not Uncharted 4, because I have not played that game. <laughs> but I do know that he figures into that game... And in case folks are thinking of writing us to say he was in Uncharted 4, that was not where. Um, He did, though, carry out what's been described as the most profitable pirate raid in history. And it was also, to be clear, a particularly brutal and horrifying raid in its treatment of the women and the men aboard the raided ship. But I did not know until I got into the research for this that it also became a massive international incident with Britain later trying to repair its relationship with the Mughal Empire, who was the target of this raid, uh, in a highly publicized and kind of weird series of trials. So we know very little about Henry Every's early life, except that he was probably English. Uh, He was born sometime in the 1650s. He might have spent some time in the Royal Navy, but sources conflict on whether or not that's actually the case. But he did start working in the slave trade in the early 1690s under a commission from the British royal governor of Bermuda. After at least a couple of years as a slave trader, Every was hired as first mate aboard the English vessel Charles II in 1693. The Charles II was a privateering vessel, and it had been commissioned to attack French ships and colonies in the Caribbean. Uh, If you need a refresher on privateering, these were basically pirates, but pirates operating with government authority (laughs) uh, to do this piratical work. Uh, By May of 1694, though, the Charles II still had not left the coast of Europe, and the crew had not been paid for any of their work so far. Naturally, the crew wasn't happy about this situation, and when the ship stopped for supplies at the Spanish port of La Coruña, Every led a mutiny. Afterward, the remaining crew elected him their captain. Every renamed the Charles II as the Fancy, which is often spelled with a PH and sometimes with an IE in documents from the time. They set a course for Madagascar following a sailing route that was known as the Pirate Round, which was popular among English pirates starting in the 1690s. Most pirates came into the Pirate Round from the Caribbean and headed southeast, so they were kind of joining in with it from the coast of Europe instead. Once it approached Africa, the route shifted south to pass the Cape of Good Hope, and then it turned north again toward Madagascar before turning east to cross the Indian Ocean. The Fancy's first piratical encounter was with three English ships, which they caught near the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of West Africa. The Fancy continued down the African coast from there, capturing and plundering ships from France and Denmark. It was 1695 by the time Every and the Fancy reached Madagascar, and by then, the Fancy had a crew of about 150 men. A whole other collection of other mostly English pirates were in the area when they got there. They were looking for a fleet that was reported to be nearby. This fleet belonged to the Mughal Empire. Now, the Mughal Empire ruled parts of the Indian subcontinent from the early 16th century into the mid-18th century. Sometimes the end point is marked a little later than that. By 1695, its territory covered most of what's now India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal. The Mughal dynasty was wealthy, and its emperor in 1695 was Aurangzeb, also known as Muhi al-Din Muhammad, or as Emperor Alamgir. It was during Aurangzeb's reign that the Mughal empire reached its peak in terms of size and power. Aurangzeb's rule of the empire and the role he played in its history is its own complicated story that we're not going to get into here, but in short, he had a reputation for ruthlessness and for religious persecution of non-Muslims in the later part of his reign. 
The fleet that the pirates were looking for was a large one. It included 25 ships, and among them were merchant vessels and escort vessels. Several of the ships were carrying Muslim pilgrims who were returning from the Hajj. And some of the ships in the fleet belonged to the emperor himself. The fleet was far too large and powerful for any one pirate ship to take on alone, which is why this collection of mostly English pirates was working together. One of the other parties involved was Thomas Tew, who was from a prominent Newport, Rhode Island family. Tew is often described as a pioneer of the pirate round, and like Henry Every, he had turned pirate after some time as a privateer. He had legitimately bought a share of a ship called the Amity in 1691, and when it was tasked with taking a French factory in West Africa, he proposed to the crew that it would be a lot more profitable to turn to piracy than to attack a factory that had no booty to plunder. It was really that simple. He was like, you know what? This whole thing where we're supposed to be attacking this factory is not going to be, it's not going to make as much money. We can make a lot more money if we attacked other ships instead. Let's stop working for the man. (laughs) Was very much like, and this whole let's stop working for the man, where is this going to come up later? Uh, It was one of the reasons that people had a lot of sympathy for pirates. Not necessarily people being attacked by them, but other people had a lot of sympathy for pirates. So... Two's turn to piracy did not stop officials from working with him, though. When this raid on the Mughal fleet took place, he was sailing under a letter of mark from the governor of Bermuda. When the pirates finally spotted a ship from the Mughal fleet, they learned that the rest of the fleet was farther away than they had thought. The first ship they took turned out to be part of the rear guard, so the fastest pirate ships, which included Every and the Fancy, raced ahead. Every encountered the Fath Mamamadi, which was part of the fleet's escort. And this ship surrendered after a brief firefight, and the fancy came away with about 50,000 British pounds worth of gold and silver. This didn't seem like that great of a haul once it was divided up among the fancy's entire crew. So Every decided to keep going and to try to find a bigger prize among the rest of the fleet. He and two other pirate ships spotted the Ganji Sawai on September 7th. So you'll sometimes see the Ganjisawai anglicized as the Gunsway in documents from the time and also in Uncharted 4. <laughs> <laughs> that historical. Uh, I don't expect Uncharted 4 to be historically accurate, by the way. So when I make that joke, I'm not criticizing it. <laughs> no. It was the largest ship in the fleet. It was possibly the largest ship in the entire Mughal Empire, and it was owned by the emperor himself. The emperor also had at least one relative aboard, although sources disagree about whether it was his daughter or his granddaughter. These were all relatives who were traveling back from Mecca. And we're going to talk about Every's encounter with this ship after we first pause for a little sponsor break. The Ganji Sawai was well-crewed and well-armed, with about 400 riflemen and several cannons. It had more soldiers and armaments than the three pirate ships that were after it, possibly even more than the entire pirate fleet did before Every and the fastest ships outdistanced the rest of them. But Every got lucky. The Fancy fired on the Ganji Sawai and at the very start of the battle destroyed its main mast. When the Ganji Sawai tried to return fire, one of its artillery pieces exploded. The resulting fire and chaos gave the Fancy time to move in and board the Ganji Sawai, which was captured after some intense hand-to-hand combat. So that just just this would have been enough to draw the ire of Emperor Aurangzeb and the rest of the Mughal Empire. But after taking the ship, the crew of the Fancy also brutalized the people on board. I cannot exaggerate. This was horrifying. They stayed with the ship for about a week as they searched for as much plunder as they could possibly haul away. During that week, the pirates tortured the men aboard to try to get information about where their valuables were. They also assaulted and raped many of the women aboard. A British colonial agent for the Mughal Emperor reported that several women aboard the ship took their own lives rather than be raped. Once the crew of the Fancy finally left the Ganji Sawai, they had taken on an immense haul of gold, silver, and jewels. It had an estimated worth of 325,000 to 600,000 British pounds at the time, which would be well into the millions today. And then they followed the pirate round back to the Caribbean, where they headed for New Providence Island in the Bahamas, which is home to the Bahamian capital of Nassau. They'd heard from other pirates that its governor, Cadwallader Jones, would be sympathetic. 
When they got to New Providence Island in March of 1696, though, Jones was no longer the governor. The new governor was Nicholas Trott, and like its predecessor, fortunately for these pirates, he was very willing to look the other way if the price was right. So, every bribed Trot to make them welcome on the island, and otherwise they didn't really advertise who they were or what they had done. They masqueraded as slave traders, and they traded the fancy for a load of ivory. Trot might have been a little less willing to deal with every if he had known what the pirates had done, or if he had any idea that he was now caught up in an international incident. But he almost certainly didn't. Word reached the Mughal Empire long before it reached Britain or any of its colonies what had happened. The Ganji Sawai struggled into harbor at Surat without most of its cargo and several of its former passengers about a week after the pirate attack. So people in the empire were outraged when they learned what every and the other pirates had done. Riots spread throughout the city of Surat. Many of these riots targeted the offices of the East India Company there. A mob tried to break in and kill the 40 or so EIC agents who were working inside, but the governor, Itimad Khan, intervened and stopped them. Although the East India Company employees' lives were spared, Khan had them all arrested. He also arrested at least three captains from East India Company ships and all the other British subjects that he could find in Surat. It's possible that he thought that the attack on the Ganji Sawai was a conspiracy and that the EIC was somehow behind it. He would not be the only person to think this, which we will talk about a little bit more in a bit. So from prison, the British captives wrote to Sir John Gayer. Gayer was a representative of the East India Company and the governor of Bombay, which is now known as Mumbai. Bombay was south of Surat and had been captured by Portugal in 1534, It came under British control in 1662 when Charles II of England married Portuguese Princess Catherine of Braganza. The East India Company was renting it from the monarch and had built its Indian headquarters there. That came up in our tea episode as well. It did. You could do a little Venn diagram of the overlapping stuff of this episode and that one. Gayer wrote to the Lords of Trade, saying that British subjects had been clapped in irons and were being imprisoned in rooms with boarded-up windows. He also reported that one English man had died of injuries he sustained in the initial melee. So, it took a long time for messages to get anywhere at this point in history, and it would be months before Gayer's communication actually got to London. In the meantime... Emperor Aurangzeb shut down four East India Company factories. He ordered an attack on Bombay. Now, if he had done this, an attack probably would have been disastrous for Bombay and for the East India Company as a whole. The EIC and the Mughal Empire had been at war just a few years before in a conflict known as Child's War. And during that time, Bombay had been under siege and partly destroyed. Fortunately for the EIC, an official named Samuel Annesley was able to negotiate a ceasefire. But it was obvious that the emperor would be more than happy to force the British completely out of India, which would have been catastrophic for British colonies and trading relationships in Asia and the Pacific. So Annesley made the emperor several promises. He promised that Britain would compensate the emperor for all his lost property and that the East India Company would begin providing escorts for all Indian ships headed toward Mecca for the Hajj. And most importantly, he promised that Henry Every would be brought to justice. So this was enough for the emperor to agree not to attack Bombay. But he also said that he would not allow trade with Britain uh, by the Mughal Empire to resume until Every was captured. Which is a serious economic situation. Yeah, extremely. (laughs) Uh, Sir John Gayer's letter detailing Henry Every's attack on the Mughal fleets, the riots, and the arrests of British subjects in Surat finally reached London in December of 1695. Other letters from Gayer, Annesley, and others arrived even later in January and May of 1696. By the time those last letters arrived, Every had already gotten to New Providence Island and unloaded the fancy. The Lords of Trade had also been succeeded by the Lords Commissioners of Trade and Plantations, also known as the Board of Trade. They were faced with what to do about Every and the situation with the Mughal Empire at their very first meeting in May of 1696. So as Holly just said, this was a serious problem. It was more than just the fact that Henry Every had attacked a ship belonging to the Mughal emperor or that he and his men had plundered the ship and brutalized its passengers and the crew. 
It was also that Emperor Aurangzeb was well convinced that England was a nation of pirates, and histories from the time reflect that belief. In the early 18th century, Persian historian Kafi Khan wrote that the East India Company's holdings in Bombay were insignificant and that, quote, the source of the remaining unstable income of the English is the plunder and capture of the ships going to the house of God. At intervals of one to two years, they attack these ships, not at the time when loaded with grains they proceed to Mecca and Jeddah, but when they return, bringing gold, silver, Ibrahimis, and rials. And there was some truth to the emperor's belief that England was a nation of pirates. Although the British Empire wasn't plundering the Mughal Empire's ships in an official capacity, a lot of the pirates that were plundering in the Caribbean and along the pirate round were English. And for the most part, those pirates left English ships alone. On top of that, multiple British colonial governors had made a habit of either tolerating pirates or actively working with them. So authorities in Britain needed to figure out not only how to repair their relationship with the Mughal Empire, but also how to send a signal to the rest of the world that the nation would not tolerate piracy. So, and then all of this was tied together in the dire economic consequence of the emperor not allowing the East India Company to operate in his territory anymore. So, Britain couldn't do anything as dramatic as, for example, summarily executing people suspected of piracy. That probably would have satisfied some of the criticism, but that would also violate British law. So, they started with a proclamation issued by the Lord Justices of England on July 17, 1696. This proclamation stated that they had received information that Henry Every, quote, under English colors acted as a common pirate and robber upon the high seas and hath presumed under such colors to commit several acts of piracy upon the seas of India or Persia, which may occasion great damage to the merchants of England trading into these parts. That's the end of the quote. This uh, proclamation went on to say that Every had stolen the ship known as the Charles from the port in Spain, and that and the proclamation commanded admirals, captains, governors, and the like to capture him, offering a reward of five hundred pounds. Another proclamation followed on August 10th, which included a lot of the same information, and also said that Every may now be going under the name Henry Bridgman. The second proclamation named a number of other alleged pirates as well, and it said that the men may have left the Caribbean and come to Ireland. Yet another proclamation followed on August 18, 1696, this one from the monarch William III, also known as William of Orange. It was a proclamation, quote, for apprehending Henry Every, alias Bridgman, and sundry other pirates. It called Every and those sundry other pirates, quote, open and villainous transgressors and it ordered essentially every sort of law enforcement and military in existence to seek out and apprehend them. The bounty offered for every was still 500 pounds sterling, and for the other pirates named, it was 50 pounds. This proclamation also indemnified all royal subjects from any, quote, hazard of slaughter, mutilation, or other acts of violence that they might commit against Avery and his accomplices, And it advised that anyone sheltering or assisting any of the pirates was doing so upon their highest peril. These proclamations made it a point of naming colonial governors among the people compelled to seek out and capture every. Because although it was well known among pirates that a number of colonial governors could be bribed or would otherwise work with them, authorities in London were only starting to become fully aware of how extensive this problem was. The proclamations did not, however, name Thomas Tew as one of the wanted pirates. Apart from the Amity being too slow to keep up with the ships that assaulted the Ganji Sawai, meaning he was not involved with that, he had been shot and killed while trying to take a different ship in that same Mughal convoy. A handful of men from Every's crew were captured in Ireland, and even though Every wasn't among them, this at least gave the Crown someone to put on trial. We're going to talk about that trial after we pause for a sponsor break. Henry Every's captured crew members were tried at the Central Criminal Court, a.k.a. the Old Bailey, in October of 1696, and this trial was weird. Number one, even though it was being tried at the Old Bailey, which is a place that has come up before when we've been talking about criminal activity in Britain during this point, it wasn't being tried under English common law. 
it was being tried under the jurisdiction of the Admiralty. And this was because common law didn't really cover nautical piracy. Number two, the reason they decided to hold a trial under the jurisdiction of the Admiralty at the Old Bailey rather than through the Admiralty Court was so that the British citizenry would have the same access to the proceedings as they would for any other criminal matter. Since part of the purpose was to send a message that the British Empire would not tolerate piracy, they needed public proceedings and public interest, not a closed-door session of the Admiralty Court. They also needed the Mughal Emperor to hear all of the details of the conviction and execution of the pirates. Even with the Admiralty's involvement, though, everything was operating a lot like any other trial at the Old Bailey. The prosecutors were all legal professionals, but the defendants were all on their own in terms of representation. The trial opened on October 19th, and Henry Every was named in the indictment even though he was still at large. Two witnesses who were former members of Every's crew provided extensive detail about the incident. But the questioning also went well beyond just what had happened with the Mughal fleet. This trial was an opportunity for authorities to learn more about the practice of piracy, and a lot of the testimony was more about that than about the Ganji Sawai. It was basically like they said, okay, you know what would be great is if we could get a a better handle on what all's going on with these pirates. So let's try to establish a whole narrative of the pirate situation rather than just investigating this one thing. So this testimony demonstrated unequivocally that the men on trial had all committed piracy. But when the jury returned a verdict, they acquitted all of them. That didn't go how they were hoping. Nope, not at all. This was a problem, and it was a complete shock to the various authorities involved. On top of failing to deliver a guilty verdict to try to satisfy the Mughal emperor, the proceedings also publicly aired a lot of evidence that multiple British colonial governors were actively working with and harboring pirates. So this whole carefully choreographed trial at the Old Bailey, just something of a PR move, (laughs) had done the opposite of what it was supposed to do. It did not send the message that Britain wouldn't tolerate pirates. It created a public record that in fact they did. And it was also a good example of how the people responsible for this proceeding were pretty out of touch with the ordinary British citizenry. Basically, people really liked pirates. Some of this was because of privateers like Sir Francis Drake and Sir Henry Morgan, who had official and unofficial support of the crown in their harassment and plundering of Spanish ships and colonies. Spain considered both of these men to be pirates, but in Britain, both of them had been knighted, Drake by Queen Elizabeth I and Morgan by King Charles II. In the public eye, they had set an example of pirates as noble patriots who only targeted Britain's enemies. But it wasn't just about people like Drake and Morgan. Henry Every himself had also become a folk hero. Not long after he commandeered the Charles II, someone had written a broadside ballad about it, first published by Theophilus Lewis in 1694. The ballad was framed as something that Every had written himself and then sent back to shore with one of the mutineers. That is certainly a fanciful fabrication, but the details in the ballad are close enough to the historical record that it's likely that whoever wrote the ballad heard about the mutiny from someone who was actually there. This ballad was not obscure, Some of the wives of sailors aboard the Charles II had filed a complaint against James Holblin, the merchant who owned the ship. This was way back before it was turned into a pirate ship. They claimed that he was traitorously enslaving their husbands. And in the case that came up before the Privy Council on August 16th of 1694, Holblin submitted a copy of this broadside ballad as part of the documents in his defense. Like, this was not a thing nobody had ever heard of. People were singing this song a lot. (laughs) It was also a pretty clear sign of how popular opinion viewed Henry Every. In a 1694 printing, it's titled A Copy of Verses Composed by Captain Henry Every, Lately Gone to Sea to Seek His Fortune. And it starts, Come all you brave boys whose courage is bold. Will you venture with me? I'll glut you with gold. Make haste unto Corona, a ship you will find. That's called the fancy. We'll pleasure your mind. Captain Every is in her and calls her his own. He will box her about, boys, before he is done. French, Spaniard, and Portuguese, the heathen likewise. He has made a war with them until that he dies. After ten more verses of very high-spirited promises of all the far-off places that Every plans to see and plunder if necessary, it ends, quote, 
Now this is the course I intend for to steer, my false-hearted nation. To you I declare I have done thee no wrong. Thou must me forgive. The sword shall maintain me as long as I live. So with all that in mind, in hindsight, it is not really all that surprising that the jury acquitted Every's crew members. They were pirates, and in the public eye, pirates were somewhere on a spectrum between folk hero and noble patriot. There's also some romanticism in the whole thing, I Uh imagine. Uh, The jury also was not particularly sympathetic to the Mughal emperor, who was a Muslim foreigner on the other side of the world. So the Admiralty, the British East India Company, and the British government were all terrified that the emperor was going to learn about the pirates' acquittal and that it would just confirm his suspicion that England was a nation of pirates. So they turned to Sir Charles Hedges, Chief Justice of the High Court of the Admiralty, to arrange another trial on a second set of charges, this time relating to the mutiny aboard the Charles II rather than the attack on the Mughal fleet. This was great because it would allow them to try the men again, but it was not ideal because the emperor definitely wasn't going to be satisfied with a conviction for mere mutiny of which he was not the victim. So in the second trial, the prosecution, again in a very carefully choreographed proceeding, tried to establish the legal idea that mutiny was theft and that theft on the high seas was piracy, so therefore mutiny was piracy but that the men were being tried for mutiny, not piracy, so this was not an issue of double jeopardy. This was some mental gymnastics, and it's even reflected in the official court record from this second trial, which ends the summation of the previous trial with, quote, the jury, contrary to the expectation of the court, brought in all prisoners not guilty, whereupon the session was adjourned to Saturday the 31st of October, and the prisoners were committed upon a new warrant for several other piracies. In the second trial, the prosecution talked to the jury a lot about how bad piracy was and how Britain looked to the rest of the world in that moment. Chief Justice Hedges also described what would happen if the pirates were acquitted once again. Quote, the barbarous nations will reproach us as being a harbor, receptacle, and a nest of pirates. And our friends will wonder to hear that the enemies of merchants and of mankind should find a sanctuary in this ancient place of trade. Nay, we ourselves cannot but confess that all kingdoms and countries who have suffered by English pirates may, for want of redress in the ordinary course, have the pretense of justice and the color of the laws of nations to justify their making reprisals upon our merchants, wheresoever they shall meet them upon the seas. In case you missed it, the Chief Justice just called the Mughal Empire a barbarous nation in court. (sighs) Uh, And even after this whole speech that was clearly designed to sway the jury, he went on to say that he was, in fact, not trying to sway the jury. (laughs) So, uh, this time, the jury convicted all of the men, and they were all hanged on November 15, 1696. And with that done, and with a lot of reparations paid, the emperor of the Mughal Empire reluctantly allowed the East India Company to resume its activities in his territory. The proceedings of the trials were collected and printed at Seven Stars of Ludgate Street, which was owned by one of London's largest printers and booksellers, the Everinghams. There are still copies of it in more than 40 libraries. Although it was very widely distributed and widely read, it did not really shift public opinion on Henry Every, or, in fact, of pirates in general. Having this thing printed and widely distributed was part of the plan from the beginning. They were like, okay, we're going to have this trial. It's going to be a very public trial. They're going to totally condemn all of these pirates. And then we're going to print all of the stuff from the trial so that everyone can read it whenever they want. It didn't It didn't really go quite as planned. Instead of everybody deciding that Henry Every was a terrible, notorious pirate that had, you know, brutalized a whole lot of people on a ship that he had raided, he continued to be the hero in a number of works of fiction. There was The Life and Adventures of Captain John Avery by a pseudonymous Captain Adrian Von Broek in 1709. 1713 saw the play The Successful Pirate, written by Charles Johnson and performed in London for several years. The King of Pirates being an account of famous enterprises of Captain Avery, the mock king of Madagascar, with his rambles and piracies, wherein all the sham accounts formerly published of him are detected, was written in 1719. It's often attributed to Daniel Defoe. Snappy title. 
Uh, Every is also, unsurprisingly, a prominent feature in A General History of Pirates, which came out in 1724 under the name Captain Charles Johnson, but is also often attributed to either Daniel Defoe or Nathaniel Mist. This colossally popular book on pirates is cited in many biographies and histories, but it is definitely not an authoritative work of nonfiction. We talk a little bit more about it in our past episode on Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. Henry Avery is the first pirate that's discussed in it. And that ballad that we talked about and and read parts of earlier survived through oral folk singing for more than 200 years. I mean, there were print copies of it still. You can still find very old copies of that original broadside. But the way that people were passing it was by singing for 200 years. In spite of an international manhunt, Henry Every was never seen again. No one knows exactly what happened to him. Most of these works of fiction contend that he married the Mughal emperor's daughter and established his own kingdom in Madagascar. It's more likely that he made his way back to England to try to hide himself from that international manhunt and died there in poverty. And Britain's very public announcements of a crackdown on piracy didn't have that much of an effect on piracy either. The golden age of piracy, which this incident happened kind of in the middle of, continued on for more than 30 years. And this was also a temporary blip in the East India Company's activities in what's now India. The EIC went on to seize huge amounts of territory on the Indian subcontinent, and it operated until 1874, A bunch of those later events have come up in other podcasts on the show, most recently in our one about the East India Company stealing tea secrets from China to then grow the tea in India. Oh, East India Company. Yeah. You're in the middle of a lot of problems. (laughs) A lot, a lot of problems. When I started this whole thing with the idea of, oh, we'll do a pirate. We haven't talked about a pirate in a while. I was not expecting a weird, convoluted uh, legal PR move to be in the third act of the show. Yeah, that's kind of the best part of the story. I mean, the whole, it's tragic because I want to acknowledge that horrible things were done. But I love the idea that they cooked up this whole thing, not thinking for a minute that people would behave counter to how they anticipated. Right. Like, there was no plan B there. They were totally like, it was we're going yeah. to convict these pirates. And the jury was it's like, It's going to be super no, public, not. you guys. <laughs> <laughs> do you um, got some listener mail? I do. I have two pieces of listener mail from folks who sent us a picture of something that they saw or did. And uh, they're both very brief. The first is from Emily. And Emily says, Dear Holly and Tracy, flying home from a conference this weekend, I caught up on podcast episodes, including the two-parter about Sadako Sasaki's Thousand Cranes. While listening to the second part, I noticed that the girl in the seat next to me was playing with her napkin. I zoned out for a while, started on another episode, and when I looked back, she had turned her napkin into a cute origami crane. So appropriate and odd. I just had to share congratulations on the thousand-plus episodes. I work as a public historian and will be starting a doctoral program in American history this fall. Even so, there are plenty of things that I missed in history class. Thanks for all you do, Emily. Thank you, Emily. What a fun little oddity to just happen spontaneously while on an airplane. And also, uh, thank you for going into public history as a field. It is very needed. It is. Have I ever told you that Brian and I always carry a crane with each of us when we fly? Oh, no. For good luck. I did not know that. So when she first said that, I was like, oh, maybe someone else does it before I opened the email and Mm -hmm. I just saw a crane on a plane as the subject line. I was like, me too. Oh, no, this is different. (laughs) That's still great, though. Uh, The other one is from Sarah. And this one's titled Pink Butter. And Sarah says, hey there, so I'm a new listener. And let me tell you, I've always had a love of history. My manager told me to check you guys out. And I'm so glad she did. I've been working my way through the episodes. And I know this may be super late. However, your episode on butter versus margarine was my absolute favorite. I'm going to pause to say I love that one too. Thank you. Uh, I recently held a party where we were discussing how to take the chemicals out of our lives. And this episode inspired me to make pink butter. I made it in my stand mixer and dyed it pink with some beet juice. And while it is not super vibrant and pink, I thought it was cute enough as a party handout. Thank you so much for the inspiration. I cannot wait to hear future episodes. Sarah. And Sarah sent a picture of her pink butter. Sarah, I have follow-up questions. Okay. Because I love beets. You love beets a lot. I super love beets. Uh Uh-huh. So I wonder if the butter had like a nice beet, subtle flavor to it. And if it was... 
delicious in a new way because that would be some good saute, I think, Mm -hmm. with that nice sweetness of beet in it. Well, and it reminded Mm -hmm. me of I have friends who sometimes will make compounded butters where they will fold all kinds of amazing things into their butter. And one time they made uh, a a Bloody Mary. It was not an alcoholic butter. I know this is not your thing. Holly's making the worst face because Bloody Marys are not, they are not not Holly drinks. Um, Anything tomato based is pretty far outside. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was the spice like the the blend of spices that you right. would use in your in your bloody that mary. That would be super. Was yummy. that was folded into it, um, and then they made. I, that's the one I remember. That was the one that I put all over my toast every morning um, while we were all on a vacation together. So thank you both for sending us these notes and for sending us these pictures of things that you saw or did in life. That is awesome. If you would like to write to us, we're at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And we are also all over social media at Missed in History. That is our name on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. Uh, you can also come to our website, which is MissedInHistory.com, where you will find show notes for all the all, all the episodes Holly and I have worked on together. The show notes for this episode includes links to the full text of a lot of those proclamations that we read from and the ballad and all of that. You can also search the archive for any episode we have ever done, ever. That is at our website, which is at mistinhistory.com. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and wherever else you get podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 